Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this special edition of Civic Saturday here on the City of Athens Facebook page. We're really grateful to the City of Athens, Athens Main Street, and the Athens Recovery Team for making today's event possible. My name is Whitney Kimball Coe, and I've produced Civic Saturday programming for Athens since about 2018 along with a team of incredible women, including Lisa Dodson, Lauren Shepard, Kay Simmons, and Julie Jack. Hopefully, those of you out there who are watching are familiar with this event. Maybe you've read about it in the Daily Post Athenian or the Morning Facts. And we also got a shout out last year in the New York Times. Or maybe you've attended one of uh, our Civic Saturday events. Our most recent gathering happened in November of last year with more than 20 young people, ages 12 to 18. And we heard this beautiful civic sermon from another daughter of Athens, Natalie Leonisio, at that one. And if you're just learning of Civic Saturday for the first time, you should know that it is a nonpartisan gathering of friends, neighbors, and strangers. And the program here is designed to nurture a spirit of shared purpose among all of us, a feeling that we're all in this together. And right now, I think we're particularly in need of naming that shared purpose. So many people across the country are feeling disconnected, isolated, and cynical about the current state of civic life, regardless of party or ideology. And our focus with Civic Saturday is to create a space where everyone is welcome and an understanding that for all our differences, we're bound together by American ideals of liberty, justice, and equality, and that it is our collective responsibility to participate and to show up in civic life. So at these Civic Saturdays, um, we focus on values and practices um, of being active citizens. At a normal Civic Saturday in Athens, we would gather in a physical space to sing what might be considered American hymns like your grand old flag or, um, uh, or the Star Spangled Banner. We might share readings, um, American civic scripture like the preamble of our constitution. And we always hear a civic sermon that calls us to powerful, responsible citizenship. In the past, we've heard from Kristen Schrader. We've heard civic sermons from Autumn Caracillo and from myself um, and Natalie. But today's program, it's gonna be a little different from our normal event. We gather today virtually on this Facebook platform instead of a physical space. And instead of a civic sermon, we're going to model a round table discussion about what responsible citizenship looks like in this time of COVID-19. So COVID-19 is a global pandemic, but our experience of it is very local. Athens, Tennessee is not experiencing this in the same way that New York City is. So we need to come to a shared understanding here locally about how to respond. McMinn County currently has 124 cases and 12 deaths. And those are our brothers, our sisters, mothers, fathers, and friends. These are real lives we're talking about. So what does it mean to be a responsible citizen in this time? What is our individual and collective responsibility right now? We're all faced with daily dilemmas around how we protect ourselves, our families, and our community, while also trying to figure out how do we stay connected, engaged, and active. It's a confusing and difficult time, and the calculations we make about staying home or venturing out are sometimes oversimplified, and sometimes they're paralyzingly complicated. Today we've asked some local leaders to have an open conversation together about how our local response, um, how, how do, about how to make a local response and how to wrestle with the question about what is our collective responsibility as Athenians and McMinn Countyans in this time? How do we show up in this time? So now I'm, I'm eager to, to really call us into this space. You've heard enough from me for a moment. This, this is a virtual space, and, and I've, we've brought together a number of beautiful voices with intention. Um, I want to turn it over to one of those voices. Uh, I want to invite my friend and my March sister, Autumn Lowry, to call us into this virtual space with a poem. This is our first civic scripture today. So I'll prom I promise she'll read it slowly and intentionally, um, and I invite everyone to, to listen in. 
take it away, Anna. Good morning. The praise song for the day, and it's written by Elizabeth Alexander. It was written for the purpose of Barack Obama's presidential inauguration. Each day we go about our business, walking past each other, catching each other's eyes or not, about to speak or speaking. All about us is noise. All about us is noise and bramble, thorn and din, each one of our ancestors on our tongues. Someone is stitching up a hem, darning, a hole in a uniform, patching a tire, repairing the things in need of repair. Someone is trying to make music somewhere with a pair of wooden spoons or an oil drum, with a cello, a boombox, harmonica, voice. A woman and her son wait for the bus. A farmer considers the changing sky. A teacher says, take out your pencils, begin. We encounter each other in words, words, spiny or smooth, whispered or declaimed, words to consider, reconsider. We cross dirt roads and highways that mark the will of someone and then others who said, I need to see what's on the other side. I know there's something better down the road. We need to find a place where we are safe. We walk into that which we cannot yet see. Say it plain, that many have died for this day. Sing the names of the dead who brought us here, who laid the train tracks, raised the bridges, picked the cotton and the lettuce, built brick by brick the glittering edifices they would then keep clean and work inside of. Praise song for the struggle, praise song for the day. Praise song for every hand-lettered sign, the figuring it out at kitchen tables. Some live by love thy neighbor as thyself, others by first do no harm and take no more than you need. What if the mightiest word is love? Love beyond marital, filial, national, love that casts a widening pool of light, love with no need to preempt grievance. In today's sharp sparkle, this winter air, anything can be made, any sentence begun. On the brink, on the brim, on the cusp. Praise song for walking forward in that light. Thank you, Autumn. Oh, that's beautiful. So I'm really excited today to introduce you to everyone on this call. Um, you're going to hear from all of these voices in the next uh, 50 minutes or so. We're going to have a roundtable discussion, and then we're going to hear. Uh, then we're going to have some time for a question and answer session. So I encourage you, as you listen to the to the roundtable discussion. If you're on that Facebook page, you can chat um, and type in questions for this panel and for our additional speakers, Autumn and Danielle Savoy. So um, please be thinking about that while you listen. So today we have, I'm gonna just go across my screen um, in the order that I see these folks. We have a city manager, C. Seth Sumner. We have, um, well, you've met Autumn Lowry. We have Dr. Bill Bowers, who's a retired local physician. We're so excited to have him here. We have Main Street Coordinator, Athens Main Street Coordinator, Lisa Dotson. Good morning. We have the Right Reverend David Graybill from Keith United Methodist Church. <laughs> oh and <my>. we have <laughs> We have Danielle Savoy, who is a new sister of mine and um, just an incredible individual who will send us out with a beautiful benediction later. Um, I think that's all I've introduced all of us. All right, so I'm excited to call this roundtable to order now, and I'm going to invite Autumn and Danielle to um, just hang tight while this group talks to one another for about 25 or 30 minutes. We've got some really great questions and we're gonna explore what it means to be a citizen in the time of COVID-19 here in Athens, Tennessee. So I'm gonna kick it off with the first question that I would like all panelists to respond to. And that is, why did you say yes to this conversation today? Why do you feel like this is an important conversation to have and uh, maybe what's at stake in your mind? For our town and community. And I'm going to ask um, Dave Graybill to kick us off. Oh, thanks, Whitney. 
Um, so yeah, I'm drawn to the uh, idea of citizenship. Um, as a pastor, I, of course, um, think about how Jesus, his main sermon topic, if you will, was the kingdom of God. And uh, that's citizenship talk. Um, we are citizens of the kingdom of God. Uh, and so I think more than we're just citizens of Athens, Tennessee, more than we're citizens of the state of Tennessee, uh, more than we're citizens of the United States of America, uh, or even the, the world, we're citizens of this, of this kingdom of God. And so uh, I think the question is, what responsibilities does our citizenship in this kingdom require of us? Um, this is something that Jesus talked about a lot um, that Paul uh, addressed in the congregations that he was writing. And so I think what's at stake is um, not just the physical health of our communities, but um, the, a, a healthy sense of interdependence with one another as citizens of this global um, kingdom uh, or reign of God. And so I think um, what's at stake is, is recovering, rediscovering that we are interdependent. We're all in this together, as we've heard so many times. Um, and then exploring, well, what does that actually mean? What does that look like on the ground? Well, thank you. And I want to come back to um, what you said about Paul's letters. I know there's a little bit more wisdom in there, too, that is applicable here. Lisa, what about you? Mm -hmm. What called you to this conversation? Yeah. Thank you, and for giving me this opportunity. I said yes, because I feel that we are in a season that we need each other. Citizenship is, uh, as Pastor Gravel said, it's, it's one that we are in this kingdom of God living. But as, a, a, as leaders, as we are, and as citizens, we depend on leaders to give us balance and direction in a time of such as this. And none of us have ever faced this before. And no matter what our um, status is, we need to talk through where we are, because talking through things is healthy. Being transparent provides us an opportunity to get those feelings out that we have never experienced before. And we are facing a situation, no matter what our um, gender is, no matter what our race is, no matter what our religious beliefs are, no matter how much money we have, our socioeconomical status, we all, we all have one thing in common right now, and that is uncertainty. And because of that uncertainty, and what that means is we don't know, right now we can't even describe our current status, and we don't know what our future holds. And for a lot of us, we've never been in that situation, and for, actually for all of us, we all that have that one common ground right now, and that is uncertainty. But what we can do right now is come together as common people, not knowing what to do, but sharpen one another in our strengths, using our weakness of that uncertainty. That uncertainty is a weakness, but yet it can be a strength because we're at a point to where we have to depend on God and each other. And we are, we are that body, uh, the world as a body, our community as a body. But we need each other as this virus is attacking our body. And so we need to see this as trauma. We have been traumatized in this season. And when you've been traumatized, your life changes. You're paralyzed. And so there's this, a portion of our body that is paralyzed from this. And when you have paralysis, you can't move. And if you move too quickly, then you're in danger of hurting yourself again. So as we make decisions to walk again from this paralysis, we need to be wise how we move and how we maneuver in our society because we need each other to stand up. Mm, that's so well said, thank you. Dr. Bill Bowers. What, why did you say yes to this conversation, and, and what do you think is at stake for us right now? Um, actually, I was very unfamiliar with your uh, Civic Saturday, and so when I got this uh, request, I thought, well, 
I'll learn a little more and participate. So that's what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, I, I really do appreciate, uh, I did call you and I said, would you do this? And you said, yeah, sure. This sounds like a conversation we need to have. Why do you think we need to have this conversation? I think we need to get everybody in order. Um, uh, I know we're trying to let people out and I know people are dissatisfied with the uh, infection control methods that we are using, the mask and the gloves and the washing the hands. But I think we need to do this. In medicine, we like to establish a control group, which would be all the people wearing masks and gloves and practicing safe uh, spacing. So we can get an idea of the true extent of this disease, which I hope will be more apparent in the next couple of weeks since many of the states are um, loosening their restrictions. Mm. Um, ex thank you. And I wanna hear more about um about your perspective on, on how we establish that con those controls. Well, I um, think the citizens themselves are going to have to be united and do the right thing. Mm -hmm. You know, even though it's a pain in the butt, uh, sometimes to wear a mask or wear these gloves, but I think this is what we need to do to just get a feel for the extent of this pandemic. Mm. And Seth, I just saw Georgia. Um, we're all excited to to have a glimpse of her. And uh, thank you for joining this conversation. What, why did you say yes and what's at stake? I, this has absolutely been on the forefront of my thought for a long time now, as I've um, reluctantly, honestly, um, committed to daily updates for over 60 days. Um, and, and James is helping us with the technology here today uh, he was behind the camera every one of those days, um, and it took hours, hours out of every day for us to do that. Um, but it was important, and, and even early on, it was so important to get the good message out there and to be have a calm, uh, relatable, trustable message uh, for our folks to keep in touch with. And, and we felt towards the end, the level of anxiety that was rising in our community. Um, and, and perhaps we, we didn't want to contribute to that anxiety. And I know everyone was, we're not through the pandemic, but everyone was tired of it. And we are, we're exhausted uh, and we're at each other. And, and that, that means that we're not able to think with clarity we're not, we're not able to serve our best purpose uh, by, by being exhausted or being angry. And so we need to, we need to take a step back and, and take a break from it. Uh, I, in all of that, I keep going back to one of my constant reminders is a brilliant Athenian, Plato, um, who said, be kind for everyone fights a hard battle. Uh, and that's true. We know that because every one of us, regardless of our station in life, regardless of our experiences, are all fighting a hard battle right now. Uh, and this pandemic is just over and above that. It's not, it's not exactly everyone's battle, but it adds to our personal battles. And so um, you ask what's at stake. And, and what, what makes my heart hurt in this entire thing and what I've seen from conversations that are being held even within our own community online um, through social media is uh, folks are focused on, uh, on freedom. Uh, what they really mean is their civil liberties. And we want to understand if people's civil, civil liberties are at stake, what is that? Because I understand our grand republic as um, our, our republic is, it's not freedom for freedom's sake. It's that we work together to do something greater than any one of us can achieve on our own. Citizenship is the core of the American way and the American dream is that we act together in the interest of the whole. That means I may have to work against my own self-interest 
so that everyone that I'm looking at right now can be successful or can succeed and can excel. And that is our pledge as an American citizen and the citizen as a citizen in the Republic is to do our part. And, and what is what, why does government even exist? Why does our government, and I say our government, it, it's not Georgia's government or Seth's government. It is all of ours. We are the government in the Republic. The people are the Republic. So why does it exist to protect the health, welfare, and safety of our people. Those three things. So how do we protect the public health? And, and, and I think we've got leaders across the United States and here in Tennessee that, um, that are doing their best. They really are. They don't have experience in this. They're leaning on people that they know and trust. And, uh, and, and we can all pick apart some decisions that have been made in our community, across the United States, but it is our duty to work together. What's at stake is democracy itself. The only thing that holds up our government, honestly, truthfully, uh -oh. the belief in each other, and so when we start questioning that, we lose faith in our democracy, we lose the republic. We, then we lose all of our freedoms. And so it is, um, uh, I said yes, because I'll, I'll probably say more than I should as city manager, I'll put my political science, I'm a former uh, professor of political science hat on and get down to the root of the issues because that's the conversation that we need to have with our people so we can understand each other. Mm. Thank you for that framing. And also thank you for um, those, the 60 daily briefings um, that the city did to, to be really consistent in communication about um, how this is affecting Athenians and McMinn County. And, um, and in line with the, those, those daily briefings, you always seem to get to kind of the concrete things that we need to be considering as we make decisions about how to go out into the world right now. Um, and that's where I'd like to take the conversation now is to invite all of you to um, share with us your thoughts about how do we make the right decision about what's acceptable risks to what are what are acceptable risks to take. Um, I wrote an article for the DPA this week that where I just kind of I threw out there some scenarios about um, experiences that I've been having this fatigue that you mentioned Seth. Um, the mental gymnastics of trying to do what's right for you, right for your family and right for the community at, all, at the same time. So I wanted to invite all of you to, um, to share with us how, how are you holding the considerations? How are you addressing them in, in concrete terms, whether it's Main Street or Keith United Methodist Church or the city or um, from Bill's perspective, you know, medically and um, medically speaking, how do we make those decisions? So I'd like to go back to Dave. Thanks, Whitney. Um, great question. I think uh, leaning on the wisdom of our scientists and medical and healthcare professionals and just providing some guidance, you know, like Dr. Bowers mentioned, some of the things that are, I don't know, are frustrating some folks, the masks and, and preventative measures, but um, I mean, that's where I look to. That's what I lean on. Um, I'm mindful of uh, George R. Stewart, who was a prominent Methodist pastor back in the 1918 plague. And um, he was writing about, uh, this is the same George Stewart, who I think the um, elementary school in Cleveland is named for, and also um, the big Stewart Auditorium, for those who know Lake Junaluska uh, in North Carolina. But he was uh, saying that uh, we need to then, that we really need to lean on our scientists and not try to tempt God uh, to miraculously preserve our health in the midst of this. And so I kind of find myself in that camp. Um, I'm certainly not a scientist, but um, I come from a family that includes scientists and doctors and, and healthcare professionals. And so just looking to their guidance. And I think how that translates over into um, Keith Church is that we have not opened back up for on-site worship yet, uh, but we are 
we formed a planning team to sort of think about what are the things that we're going to want to do whenever that time comes. And that's what we're looking to. We're looking at the mass. We're looking at the distance. We're looking at um, even science that says congregational singing um, is problematic. Uh, and that, as a Methodist, that hurts my heart to hear. But, uh, but I think that's important, again, for us in the decisions we make. We know that it won't be forever, but for the time being to follow the, the best guidance that's out there from the folks who are studying. It's a scientific, it's a biological problem. These are the experts in that area, and that's really where I look to for guidance. Mm -hmm. And the science that you are talking about, are, are there some concrete sources that you um, are leaning on? Yeah, so I have a good friend who is a graduate of uh, the Johns Hopkins Medical School. And so he pointed me to their website that tracks data, but also um, I think has some really good information to share. Um, and also as everyone is following the CDC and other places, but um, that's, a, that's a website that's been helpful to me. Thank you. Lisa, how about you? How are you um, going about your, your work day and uh, what are your considerations? Yeah, I, along with um, Pastor Greibel, you know, I'm leaning and depending on the medical um, side of this, as well as my spiritual guidance, <laughs> trusting God to order my steps. But I have three very close people around my circle. My daughter, for one, is a resident in Ohio at Ohio State University. My uh, physician and a very dear, uh, one of my best friends in Middle Tennessee, and my niece, who is also a physician in Memphis, Tennessee. And so listening to them, knowing that they're in that war zone, they're right there on the front lines. So I'm listening to them give guidance to me and to our families of what to do and to be wise in our movement and that this virus is real. You know, people may be comparing it to the flu, but it is very much different from just the flu. And so we, we are, we're seeing that people are, are dying from this. I have a brother right now in the Life Care Center of Athens, Tennessee, that has no choice to, of being there. So he's confined within that and, and tested positive. He's doing well. But here's a situation that's very dear, near to my heart. It's very close. And so I am uh, trusting that I need to do and take the right precautions for my family, even to the point of uh, Tony and I, my husband, we keep our grandkids every other weekend. We, they've not stayed with us since March. So that's how serious I am about being wise. We go outside, we see them outside their home, in their yard. We play with them, we keep in contact with them, but we have to be mindful of them, their health, because we're out in the grocery stores and, and in different places. I'm downtown Athens, you know, with uh, the business owners. So I have to be mindful that I'm not carrying anything to my grandchildren or their mother. Mm -hmm. And so on, that's on the personal side. So on my professional side, I'm the promoter for downtown Athens businesses you know, shop local, shop throughout the entire city. Downtown's my focus, but I, I promote the entire city and the community. So I kind of feel like I have an unbalanced scale here because I'm saying go out and shop, but yet do your part to stay apart and stay home. So what I did with that professionally was go to our business owners downtown ask them, what are you doing to provide safe shopping to our community? And they were willing to share those steps and those guidelines with, with me and with the community because daily we're getting updates through Seth from our city manager Seth from the governor. And so we have been distributing those guidelines through the Athens recovery team, Athens economic recovery team. And so with those, we have taken the steps that we need to to educate our businesses. And so thankfully, they are following those guidelines. And so I would honestly 99% say, probably 100, our downtown is safe. They're doing things 
to, to provide safe shopping and safe eating and dining for our community. And they did not stop. Even some of the restaurants were offering curbside service during the time when everything was shut down. So professionally, I've been trying to gain knowledge so that I can then distribute that knowledge and those guidelines to our businesses. And mm -hmm. I really believe that we're doing what we can professionally to, to, to provide that balance. So I would encourage anyone, I'll do a commercial pitch, if you need to shop, shop local because our local businesses need your support. And we need to, yes, we need our economy to come back, but also we need to stay mindful and healthy. So when you go out, do your social distancing, stay six feet apart, wear your mask. If you don't feel comfortable wearing a mask, don't discredit someone else that does. So, okay. let's, and that's a, yes, go sorry. Ahead. I was just gonna say, that's a really good segue to, um, one of the things that I'm hoping Bill is going to answer for us is, is this question of masks and the role it can play um, in mitigating risks and also helping us like continue to shop locally to go out, you know, to make those decisions to go to the grocery store. But I w I've got to say, I was at the grocery store the other day and I really mostly just saw the employees wearing the masks and the shoppers not. And it made me wonder, you know, what, are, what, is, what does that say about our, our response, our collective response, are we taking care of, for instance, our, our grocery staff, um, if we're not protecting them from, you know, if we're not wearing masks too. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I'm, I'm wondering, Dr. Bowers, if you could share a little bit about why masks, why, why we think masks are important um, and, and anything else you'd like to share about the considerations we need to be taking. Well, the main reason for the mask is because transmission of the COVID virus is uh, droplet. <clears throat> and when we talk about droplets, so we're not talking about droplets like tears or stuff that we can actually see. We're talking about um, aerosol droplets. That's the small droplets that would come out of a spray can, that small. And, uh, but we do know that the mask will cut that contamination down uh, and that's why that's the main reason for wearing the mask is is to stop the spread of the virus that's the way it spreads so let's get it in the air before it gets out it's um, terrible that the um, shop owners are doing so well but the shoppers are so stupid I mean, that's the only thing you can say about it. It's just stupid uh, to not use some type of protection, uh, which is, uh, and because to keep yourself disease free and to keep others uh, disease free. Mm -hmm. I don't get it. I don't, I can't figure out why people don't want to wear a mask. And we're just talking about a short shopping trip or something. I'm not talking about wearing masks at home all day long or something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it has been, you know, politicized in a lot of ways. What are some other um, considerations people ought to have as they're going through the mental gymnastics of, you know, should I go sit outside with my friends? Um, yes. I can do that. Yeah. Uh, um, the um, COVID is very sensitive to um, ultraviolet light, sunlight, you know, and, and uh, I would think even by if you're working on your, when you get home, sit outside in the sun for 15 or 20 minutes and maybe decontaminate yourself. Um, I think that's important. In my home, I purchased a UV light, which is uh, um, supposedly very effective uh, against uh, bacteria and viruses. Mm -hmm. So I'm still doing a little research. I'm still moving the light around every room uh, uh, periodically and turning it on for about an hour. I don't know what it does. Uh, I don't know what it's doing, um, but they say yeah. it, it helps. Um, well, it's true. I have, I've, I've read that um, on all those trusted sites that um, Reverend Grayville mentioned. So that UV light is a, um, mm -hmm. a decontaminant. So Seth, um, what are you seeing out there and uh, what, what are some of the considerations we need to be holding? Well, uh, I wanted to follow up on the UV light because we're actually okay. installing a UV filter on our splash pad so that we can 
hopefully have it open even even during the pandemic um, to make sure that uh, that that water is safe because we want our kids out playing in our parks. We we need we're social creatures. We need social interaction. I'm obviously a, a big extrovert and I need that. So it, this has been very difficult um, on me personally, um, not, not because of the, the extra hours, not because of, to, to be truthful, early on I was incredibly energized by, by the pandemic. Although my, my heart hurts, I hate to see anybody sick I hate to see anybody dying. I hate to see our businesses closed. I don't want any of that to happen under any circumstances. Um, but as the city manager, um, what folks watching, if you're unaware, uh, I, I manage all of the day-to-day -day activities of the entire city of Athens. And so uh, you look at public safety, at public health, at parks, at everything that, uh, that we do throughout this community, infrastructure, um, that that's my charge. I, I, I hope this isn't taken wrong, but I have been so energized by this uh, by the opportunity to dive in and actually handle one thing at a time systematically, and to be able to pivot our local government and the way that we're responding. Um, you know, we're able to pivot on a dime, and that's that. Uh, Government for me, I, you know, we're we're the government closest to the people. Um, that is absolutely responsible for. Uh, it's our friends and neighbors. It's not a, a, a nameless, faceless person. Um, it's our friends and neighbors that we're in this together, and so we don't move fast enough. Not for my liking. Not for many people's liking. And our government. I'm the CEO of of the corporation that is our government. And, uh, and for us, uh, uh, you know, we, we're built on the business model. We're supposed to be the quickest response, the, the we're able to pivot and go and respond to our citizens' needs. And, and that's not really truthfully how we've acted over decades and decades. And, uh, and I've been able to actually pivot and move things in our local government to respond to this pandemic um, that, that has me exhilarated in seeing how fast and how sometimes innovative we can be with our response into, and, and protecting the public health. We've, uh, what, what I, I've loved to talk about uh, over the last uh, couple weeks now has been we didn't lead through orders, we didn't lead through, um, through a, an, a emergency powers, we led by simply communicating with the public. We just spread the good message, the honest message, the truth about this pandemic, about its damages and harms, about what our best practices and guidelines are. And, and we spread that good message and just working with our people by being able to communicate through thankfully this kind of technology right here on a daily basis that we, we're all in this together, we're gonna get through it together, but that means we all have to be responsible together. And so that, uh, I think there's a lot of really good lessons that come out of this. And I've talked with my senior staff uh, on several occasions now. I don't, I don't know that there's gonna be a, a whole lot that we're gonna change and go back to the way that we were used to do things. I think this is a new normal for how government interacts with our people, uh, with with our uh, the people that are in charge of us, um, how do we deliver those uh, those services? And I think we're on our new model, and it's a faster, more responsive model, and that's invigorating to me because that's exactly what we need to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, that's a that's also a really nice segue um, into my last question for you all before we open the the door for questions from the audience. Um, but this idea of, of response and pivoting, that, that's the new word these days. How are you pivoting in the midst of COVID? How are you kind of reimagining how we uh, d uh, contribute services? How do we access services? How do we problem solve? 
um, in a crisis time. And one of my friends said a really beautiful thing to me the other day. She said, you know, you know um, that you have a good foundation if people are coming to it and if, um, and if it's of service in the midst of a crisis. Um, and I, I think um, we've seen that COVID has shown a spotlight on the foundational pieces, on the things that really matter and, and what, what are good services um, in this time. So I want everybody to have, take about a minute um, and share with me, you know, what, what, has, what have you learned about our community in this time? What do you wanna hold on to um, that we've learned through this, um, this difficult time? So I'd like to go back to Dave. Thanks, Whitney. Um, yeah, I think uh, I resonate with what Seth was. Uh, the um, uh, the pivoting. I think that I've seen a, a remarkable agility um, in in churches, in community agencies, and organizations to really rise up and find ways to respond to the urgency uh, in some really creative ways. Uh, and so I think going forward, um, it'll be interesting to see. And I hope that we can continue to harness that energy that Seth was mentioning and that creativity to address some of the uh, issues and problems that pre-existed this uh, crisis that uh, are continuing through it, that the crisis has sort of uh, shown a spotlight on, as you said, Whitney. And then um, it, so that we can kind of address those when the situation is not as urgent but the problems are still very real and important. So I've been impressed with the agility and uh, sort of the nimbleness of the community. Uh, and I think particularly the community this size can be that way very quickly. I think that's true too, that we're in a way we're fortunate. Um, we're, not a, we're not in New York City in the sense of having to manage millions of people. Um, we have a small enough population that proximity to one another and um, and the relationships that we have here allow us to, to try new things, experiment and, and pivot. Um, I think that's really important. Lisa, what are, you, what are your thoughts about what we wanna hold on to, what, all those things? Yes, uh, I'd like to see us hold on to the, um, to the unity and some of the um, rethinking and reimagining as Seth was talking about that we realized some of the things that we were doing may not be important and we go to a more simpler way of doing things and then we uh, pause pivot and rethink and i think that we move our community uh, you know our new saying is friendly city forward that we we are in position right now to move our city forward and as long as we work together make wise decisions be mindful of one another and continue to impart to one another what we can do to help our community grow. And so I, I hope we um, hold on to that. I experienced that yesterday with a group of concerned citizens pulled together to put up the uh, flags around the courthouse in downtown for Memorial Day. And that was a group of citizens that just had a concern for them to go up. It was a normal, normally traditionally it, it had been a downtown business association a project which transferred to Main Street since we merged. And we did not have, Main Street didn't have the manpower to do it. And so these citizens found out that the flags were not gonna go up and they took it upon themselves to rally a group of people together, to get the equipment together and make sure that the flags were hung up for Memorial Day. And to me, that's, that is community. When people come together with a passion to do something and to make something happen, for the good, for the betterment, and that is community. And I hope that we keep that momentum going. And I hope and I pray that we come out of this better and not bitter, not angry for what we've been through, but better because we had a chance to just rest and to rethink who we are and what we're supposed to do and why we're doing it. And when we come out of this, we're, we will be better for ourselves, for our families, for our community and, and make a difference in our, our state, in our nation. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for mentioning that, uh, the event that happened yesterday or the volunteers showing up to put up those flags. Um, I was thinking about how Memorial Day is coming up and we'll be honoring the fallen um, 
in our country, to those who fought in wars um, and our veterans. And I wonder too, how, how are we going to be mourning the more than 90,000 people who've lost their lives to COVID? Um, and I, so I wonder for Dr. Bowers, if, um, if you have thoughts just about, about death in this time and, and how, do we, um, how do we move forward in the, in the best way possible and also honor those deaths um, that, have, that have occurred? Wow. Um, the, um, it's on you. <laughs> of, of course, um, the majority of deaths were in the very elderly, um, which sometimes, I hate to say this, is God's plan that these very elderly will be more susceptible. That's well, the, way the, the way the world turns. And I think well, we just need to accept that and and go on especially in a in a nursing home environment these are very fragile people well i agree i mean i i hear what you're saying about um age but also these are you know mothers daughters yes mothers, sisters so just thinking about you know what what have we what can we learn now from um from this time we've been in and what do we want to hold on to moving forward? Maybe, maybe let's go that direction. I think it all gets down to just um, realizing that we're in a pandemic. We're going to have to accept what is going on. Uh, there's going to be a lot of heartbreak. Um, that's all I can say about dying okay. people, you know, there's yeah. heartbreak. Um, I would say something about making sure that anybody that's in a nursing home has a advanced directive. I'll throw that in right now. That's a living will. Yeah, this is forcing us all to think about mortality. Um, yes, a lot, a lot more in um, and how how do um, how do we achieve the uh, or do all the things that we need to do. Um, so Seth, what about you? What are your final thoughts? Um, I, 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 I do like uh, history and uh, my wife brought up the uh, yellow fever outbreak in Philadelphia in 1793, uh, where that was at the time the capital of our young nation. And uh, that this is not the first time that our, our resolve has been tested in this manner. Uh, we saw folks fleeing the city, including our, our president uh, getting out of the city. Um, fa whole families were wiped out. Handshaking stopped. Um, folks began covering their face with cloth to protect themselves from the virus. Uh, there are a lot of parallels in, from 1793 to today. But what we have gained in that time is, uh, is technological advances that allow us to communicate and share the message quickly. And so um, our, our dependency, our investments, as, as I've looked uh, for the city's budget for this upcoming year, what we've offered to the council for their consideration is larger investments in technology so that uh, we can continue to move quickly move this city forward in ways that are going to be better communication for our citizens. Um, and so I'll tell you in my personal life, um, I'm, I'm looking at the positive in all things. And I have, I've been home more than I would be under, under any normal circumstances. I, I have to travel a lot. There's a lot of late night meetings, things of that nature that are largely not being done now. Um, and and I'm, I'm thankful for that. I'm home with my family where I need to be, where I want to be. And um, um, I'm, I, you know, I'm able to have the, the, the life that I, I imagined and it, was, it had to be forced upon me. Um, and so I'm, I'm counting that as a blessing that I'm here at home with my family and not sitting in a boardroom late at night, three days a week, um, 
it shows me that we can conduct our business in other ways. We can be more efficient with the way that we do that. We can use technology to come together um, and share the good message. And, and other than that, we can free up some of our time to spend with the most important people in our lives and be more effective in our daily living because we're with our loved ones. Mm -hmm. I, th I really appreciate you saying some of that. And I think um, the future of work and the future of, uh, for all of us, whether we work at, um, in an office job or at a plant or um, in the service industry, I think we all, hopefully, we're all taking stock of what is, um, what kind of work life and identity we want to have and um, how the exchange of um, time spent at the office and time spent at home and uh, what's essential right now. Um, I really hope people are taking that in. So I'd like to invite Autumn Lowry back and um, Danielle Savoy and ask Autumn if there are any um, burning questions from our Facebook audience. I've not been watching the feed because I've been watching our panelists. I've got you, Whitney. So we do have questions. I'll start with the first one. Uh, uh, the first one that was asked, I thought needed to be addressed was, are we still doing drive-through testing? That's a good one. Who would yeah. like to answer that? Seth, I think you can. Yeah. Yes, we are. Uh, there is Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. until noon, drive-through testing is being conducted absolutely free of charge for anybody that wants to. You don't have to have symptoms. All you have to do is want to be tested. And uh, that is at the McMinn County Health Department. And so all of that information you can find on friendlycityforward.com. Um, and also you could just uh, do a, uh, a, an internet search for that. I also know that, uh, that AFC Urgent Care um, is a, uh, a for-profit facility here in the, in the city of Athens. A, a, uh, uh, the, and they are offering the testing as well, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday, and they do have Saturday hours as well. So uh, there are two options that I'm aware of in the community. And I'm okay. not sure whether AFC is charging for those or not. I do know that the McMinn Health Department is free. Excellent. Thank you. And we're in the testing piece we didn't really talk about today, but um, science says we need to be all getting ourselves tested perhaps regularly um, so that we can establish that group. That can and and look, one thing that I, I mentioned several times on my daily updates that I'm so proud of in this community, um, some of the ugliness and bitterness that we've seen uh, throughout uh, is not coming from Athenians. Um, what we know about McMinn County, what Athenians have done is we've got tested at a higher rate than just about anywhere else in the state of Tennessee. We've done our part. Uh, we have, we've adopted social distancing, which uh, reading, reading scholarly articles has been the number one thing that we can, that we have done and can continue to do is the social distancing part. I'm terribly proud of our Athenians for that. Thank you. Autumn, are there, we, I think we've got time for probably two more questions. Sure. Um, are there other ways to get out the word to other people in the community to keep safe? Things like masks, social distancing, like is there anything else we can do um, to get the word out uh, about how important that is? Who would like to take that on? Are there, are there interesting ways we could do that? We can certainly model it. What we know about how, uh, how McMinn Countyans and Athenians pay attention to, the, the biggest source um, and I've got the analytical data to, to prove this. The biggest source of information in our community is shared by word of mouth. Not, not face, Facebook's actually number two, but word of mouth is number one, which can be difficult because we're socially distancing. Um, but for consideration, I'd love to hear what, uh, what anybody else has to say about that. Well, I would, I'll, I'll briefly answer, Whitney. I would agree with word of mouth and Facebook. I think each one of us can do our part to be an example of what we should be doing when we go out and uh, just continue to stress it and not forget, even when we're having our small social events and if we post pictures on Facebook, 
show people that we're doing, that we're gathering and we're doing it uh, based on the guidelines that we should do it by social distancing. And I think it's kind of like it's, it's like the virus, it's contagious, it catches on. When you begin to show people how it's done, they will then take heed to say, oh, I'm not wearing my mask, maybe I need to put this on. And so it, it, I think when we take responsibility, that's the phase we're in right now, I believe, is taking responsibility for where we are and what we are supposed to do individually. And then it begins to spread to everybody else. Mm -hmm. Be an example. That was a good um, answer, Lisa. Taking responsibility and, and continuing to do best practices and it does spread. Thank you. Yeah. Autumn, what, is there one more? We do. I'm going to actually combine two, if that's okay, because uh, they're kind of in the same vein. So yeah. um, this one was for our community leaders who have joined us. How do we work with people to understand what our new normal might be? Um, um, for those folks who are on board with that and who really want to move in that direction, and then for those who are kind of resistant to that or who want to get back to the way things were, so to speak. Uh, and the other one was, how do the new guidelines of gatherings of 50 versus 10 may impact our community since we're smaller? Um, so those are, the, those are the last two. Good questions. I like those. I can tackle the new normal if you'd like me to, Whitney. Right. Uh, I would like to encourage everyone to realize that the way our life used to be is, is changed completely, drastically. And I'm, this is not a really good scenario. It's kind of sad, but it's true. It's kind of like you, you have a loved one and you've lost a loved one. And that person has been in your life all your life. And they pass away. And you're trying to celebrate your holidays and birthdays the way you used to, and they're not there. Those same things that you used to do have changed. It's not that your past is bad, you know, just realize, re may come to the realization that we cannot step out our doors the way we used to. Our, our normal as we have known it is completely changed. Now, when you come to the realization, just like in a death, when you accept that fact, that's when you can begin to heal. That's when you can begin to move forward into the new steps of the way we need to do things. Right now we're wearing masks and we're washing hands and we're staying clean. Continue to do those things. Once, the, once this virus gone, is gone, I believe there will be a day that we will be able to do things differently. But right now, don't try to relate what you used to do which, to now, because it's different. And so the main thing is mentally accepting where we are. And when you do that, then you can move forward. We can't say we have a new normal because every day is different. The new normal basically is accepting that every day is different. Mm. And try to embrace every day as it is and enjoy it because life is precious. Enjoy the moments you have where you are and what you're doing. Because if you're dreading it, you will miss out on what life really is all about. Mm. So take advantage of this time and do that. Amen, and Lisa. Hey, Dave, would you mind weighing in on this one too? Speaking of preaching, just think that, yeah. was, a, that was a really good handoff, Lisa. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's hard to follow, Lisa. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I was thinking, that's a great question. I was thinking back to um, how life was before and after 9-11. And um, some of the new normal when it came to like flying um, and some of the things that we had to go through security wise and, and how that was. And, and then we, we kind of adapted to that. But I think um, just like 9-11 sort of punctured this sense of invulnerability that we thought we had as a nation. Um, I think this virus is, is puncturing some of the invulnerability we may feel health wise, we may feel economy wise, community wise. And so I think similarly, we'll live into this new reality, whatever that looks like. I think forums like this, where we uh, talk together about what that can look like in our local communities, 
are so important. So I hope that kind of conversations like this will continue in some ways as we figure that out together. That was a really great question to, to kind of wrap all this up um, for the day. And uh, I'm, I'm just so grateful to all of you for putting yourselves out there as leaders and um, to make yourself vulnerable in front of this big audience um, and share some of your uh, reflections on how we're all experiencing this time of uncertainty, but also how we're all uh, hopefully leaning into our interdependency um, as citizens uh, and uh, of, of, the same, of the same community, human and Athenian. Uh, I would like to close this event today with a, a benediction of sorts, another civic scripture, and invite um, my new friend Danielle to, to offer this poem. And I'd also like to say that when we gather again for Civic Saturday, whether it's virtual or in person, we can look forward to a civic sermon from Danielle. She's already agreed to do that for us. Um, so I hope, I hope we'll, get, we'll be back together um, here soon uh, to continue this conversation. Um, so Danielle, could you send us off, please? Yes. Thank you, guys. Um, so I'm going to be reading On the Pulse of Mourning by Maya Angelou. If I'm not mistaken, it was read at Bill Clinton's first inauguration on the Pulse of Mourning by Maya Angelou. And um, I chose this one because literally we woke up with confidence and assuredness on what our day would look like. And when the city had to shut down, we all went to bed afraid, unsure, and in the same space collectively. So um, here goes. A rock, a river, a tree, host to species long since departed, marked the mastodon, the dinosaur who left dry tokens of their sojourn here on our planet floor. Any broad alarm of their hastening doom is lost in the gloom of dust and ages. But today, the rock cries out to us, clearly, forcefully, come, you may stand upon my back and face your distant destiny, but seek no haven in my shadow. I will give you no more hiding place down here. You, created only a little lower than the angels, have crouched too long in the bruising darkness, having lain too long face down in ignorance. Your mouth spilling words armed for slaughter. The rock cries out today. You may stand on me, but do not hide your face. Across the wall of the world, a river sings a beautiful song. Come, rest here by my side. Each of you a bordered country, delicate and strangely made proud, yet thrusting perpetually under siege. Your armed struggles for profit have left collars of waste upon my shore currents of debris upon my breast, yet today I call you to my riverside. If you will study war no more, come. Clad in peace and I will sing the songs the creator gave to me when I and the tree and the stone were one. Before cynicism was a bloody sear across your brow and when you yet knew you still knew nothing. The river sings and sings on. There is a true yearning to respond to the singing river and the wise rock. So say the Asian, the Hispanic, the Jew, the African and Native American, the Sioux, the Catholic, the Muslim, the French, the Greek, the Irish, the rabbi, the priest, the sheik, the gay, the straight, the preacher, the privileged, the homeless and the teacher. They hear, they all hear the speaking of the tree. Today, the first and last of every tree speaks to humankind. Come to me here beside the river. Each of you, descendant of some passed on traveler, has been paid for. You who gave me my first name. You, Pawnee, Apache, and Seneca. You, Cherokee Nation, who rested with me, 
been forced on bloody feet left me to the employment of others, seeking desperate for gain and starving for gold. You, the Turk, the Swede, the German, the Scot, you, the Ashanti, the Yoruba, the crew, bought, sold, stolen, arriving on a nightmare and praying for a dream. Here, root yourselves beside me. I am the tree planted by the river, which will not be moved. I, the rock, I, the river, I, the tree, I am yours. Your passages have been paid. Lift up your faces. You have a piercing need for this bright morning dawning for you. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived. And if faced with courage, need not be lived again. Lift up your eyes upon the day breaking for you. Give birth again to the dream. Women, children, men, take it to the palm of your hands. Mold it into the shape of your most private need. Sculpt it into the image of your most public self. Lift up your hearts. Each new hour holds new chances for new beginnings. Do not be wedded forever to fear, yoked eternally to brutishness. The horizon leans forward, offering you space to place new steps of change here. On the pulse of this fine day, you may have the courage to look up and out upon me, the rock, the river, the tree, your country. No less Midas than the Minigant, no less to you now than the Mastodon, here on the pulse of this new day, you may have the grace to look up and out and into your sister's eyes and into your brother's face, your country, and simply, so very simply, with hope, say good morning. Ashe and amen. Amen. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you all. That was beautiful. A recording of this uh, conversation will be posted on the Friendly City Forward website at friendlycityforward.com. So please feel free to go back and listen and listen to that beautiful poetry again, too. All right. Take on the day. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks, Whitney. Bye-bye, guys. Be blessed.